we are considering the prophecy that the father of John the Baptist, Zacharias, uttered after the birth of his son John when he announced to the neighbors and cousins that the name of this boy would be John as he was named by the angel Gabriel. And I want to take you to Luke 167, and I want to read through to verse 75 of this prophecy. Uh, after verse 75, he talks about John the Baptist, his son. But before that, his focus is on the Lord Jesus Christ, who at this particular point in time has been in the womb of the Virgin Mary for three months. He's going through his gestation. His body is developing um, in the womb of the Virgin. But the words of Zechariah have been fulfilled at this point in that God has visited his people. Because in that little baby developing in the womb of the virgin, joined that human flesh and blood person, was joined to the second person of the Trinity, the word who was and is God. So literally, God now had visited his people. But let's start at verse 67. And the father of Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, so what we are about to read here is something that is inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. These are not merely the words of Zacharias. They are the words of the Holy Ghost spoken through him. And he prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spake with the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. One of the things that I pointed out to you already is to step back and get a bird's eye view of this prophecy. That's what I've been doing. And one of the things that I pointed out to you that clearly emerges is that you have two groups of people. You have God's people whom he has redeemed and you have their enemies. And it's obvious from the passage that redemption is not intended for the enemies. It's intended for the people of God to be redeemed from the hand of their enemies. And so here emerges clearly an example of the great doctrine of election. God's people whom he has chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world and the rest. And But as I'm considering this bird's eye view, more has yet emerged. I was thinking about it this morning, and I am just utterly amazed at how rich this prophecy is. The prophecy begins in verse 68, and if you track it down to verse 75, you have eight verses. And in these eight verses, these eight short little verses, you have an overview of the history of the entire world from its beginning to its end. Notice, for example, references made in verse 70 to the beginning of the world, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. So this takes us right back to Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it lets us know that the universe and the matter that makes it up is not eternal. It has a distinct beginning. In the beginning, since the world began. So this takes us all the way back to the book of Genesis. But then it also leaps and goes all the way to the end of human history as he talks about the redemption of his people involving them being saved from their enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. And when we look at what the Bible describes will happen at the end of time, which will be marked by the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is going to be a redemption from our enemies, the full final redemption for our, from our enemies that will take place at that time. Remember, he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed 
as we're told in 1 Corinthians 15, is death. And this will occur for us, the destruction of the death of our bodies and the resurrection of our bodies, the redemption of our bodies from the captivity of that last enemy, which is death. We read about this, for example, in Romans 8, 21, when he speaks that the creature itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. This is what our bodies are involved in right now. They are corruptible bodies, and they are bound by that corruption. We are in captivity to the corruption process, which is the death process that works in us until finally the, the body dissolves in death. But in the end, at the coming of Christ, when our bodies are raised from the dead, they will be delivered from that bondage of corruption, from captivity to that enemy death. We will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption, the deliverance, the salvation of our bodies from death and corruption. So there we have the full redemption of us occurring at the end of time in redeeming our body from the bondage of death, from that last enemy, which is death. Furthermore, at the second coming of Christ, this is when he will fully, finally crush Satan's one world empire that he's been working on throughout history, and, he, and that he will bring into its last and ultimate expression in the last years of this earth's history in what is called the beast, the reign of the beast or the man of sin. And the beast and his armies will be gathered together to fight against God and against his Christ at the end of time. You read about this in Revelation 19, when the Lord appears on a white horse with his vesture dipped in blood and coming to smite the nations with the rod of his mouth. This is outlined in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through the end of the chapter. There you see the final battle. There you see the final and ultimate defeat of Satan and his allies and his armies and his empire and their program that stands in opposition to God and to his Christ. This particular moment that will occur at the end of human history, we referenced last time toward the end of our study when we walked you through the first six verses of Isaiah 63 where Jesus Christ is presented as having his garments uh, like him that treadeth in the winepress, uh, as it were, um, stained with the blood of the grapes as he treads them out in the winepress, representing the fact that his garments will be stained with the blood of his enemies when he comes to trample them out and take vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel and are the enemies of his people. And this particular time when this occurs, as it's laid out in Revelation 19 and laid out here in Ezekiel, pardon me, Isaiah 63, is called the year of my redeemed. This is when he comes to fully, finally redeem us from the hand of all our enemies. This particular event in history is also referenced in Isaiah 34, Isaiah 34 and verse 6. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats and with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. Basra was this, belonged to the nation of Edom. Idumea is a name, another name for the nation of Edom. Edom is the nation that descended from Esau which is the archetype of the non-elect. Edom stands in opposition to Israel. Edom represents the enemies of God's people. And here they will be fully, finally trampled and destroyed. And we read in verse seven, and the unicorns shall come down with them 
and the bullocks with the bulls. And their land shall be soaked with blood and their dust made fat with fatness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. So all the controversy that's been leveled against God's people, against God's church called Zion, all of those controversies will be settled and an end will be made of them at the second coming of our Lord when at last his people are fully and finally delivered from all their enemies, the enemy of death and corruption in their bodies and the en their enemies seen and unseen in this world throughout all history. And so what we see in this prophecy of Zechariah is he goes all the way back to the beginning of the world and then reaches all the way through to the end of the world, the year of God's redeemed, the year for the settling of the controversies of Zion to occur at the end of human history, when Christ will have put down all rule and all authority and all power, put all enemies under his feet, the last enemy being death itself. So it's just amazing how this, in these eight verses, he just takes in the whole of human history. So, and, and it's interesting that when you look at God's plan, God's plan is to redeem his elect throughout all the successive generations of history. In every generation, from the first generation, from Adam and Eve, all the way to the end of time, God has had his elect within those generations. And what God has been doing throughout history, as his elect are conceived and born, he harvests them out and saves them by his grace, thus redeeming them out of every kindred and tongue and tribe and people. This is what God has been doing throughout history. And so you could say that God's plan of redemption is central to the whole of human history. In fact, I take you back to Romans 9 to remind you that the only reason the world still stands and history is still going on and being made is God still has not as yet harvested out all of his elect. And this is what we read in Romans 9.22. And if you wonder why God puts up with all the wickedness and the perversion that we see in the world, it is because among those wicked and perverse nations are God's children, lost and ruined in sin that Christ died to save. And God is going to visit them during their lifetime with his salvation, change their nature, cause them to be born again, quickened from spiritual death to spiritual life. And when that has happened to the last one of God's elect to be born in this world, it'll be over for this world. God's purpose of redemption will have been accomplished. And you can see this from Romans 9, 22 and 23, which I have referenced to you on numerous occasions. I'm actually going to read down to verse 24. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured just putting up with the vessel with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, now, why is he enduring this? He'll tell you in the next verse. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. See, the vessels of mercy he afore prepared unto glory. He chose them in Christ Jesus before, afore the foundation of the world. He predestinated them to eternal life and eternal glory and eternal salvation before the foundation of the world. They were afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And so this is the story of all human history. And all history revolves around this glorious plan of redemption that God drafted before the foundation of the world to save a people and to bring them unto himself. History does not revolve around the environment. It does not revolve around economy. It revolves around God's plan of redemption. Now, this particular plan of redemption, this promise 
that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us has been spoken, promised, and prophesied by holy prophets since the world began. This would take us all the way back to Adam. He would have been the first prophet. He was the one that would have been uh, apprised of what God said to Satan, that Satan and that he God would put enmity between the seed of the serpent and the woman, between the seed of the serpent and her seed. And Satan would seed would bruise the head of the seed of the woman and the seed of the woman would bruise his heel. No, pardon me. Let me get that. I had it backwards. In fact, I'm going to go read it. I'm trying to quote at it. And I'm my brain is dyslexic. It's saying it backwards. So let me straighten this out before I go forward. Genesis 3.15. This takes us back to the beginning of the world when the prophets begin to speak of this coming redemption. Here it is promised in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee, that's Satan, and the woman, and between thy seed, that's Satan and all his children, and her seed, that's Jesus Christ, and all of those who are chosen in Jesus Christ. It, the seed of the woman, shall bruise thy head. This is a mortal wound, a fatal wound, an ultimate destruction of Satan and his seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel which occurred on the cross of Calvary when Christ uh, underwent the crucifixion that was engineered by Satan, although prophesied by God and determined by God, but engineered by Satan with the attempt to destroy God's Christ. He did not destroy him. He simply bruised his heel. And then he rose again triumphant from the dead to deliver to Satan the fatal final blow to his head. But you can see all the way back to the beginning. We start with Adam and we have prophets moving forward. We go from Adam, then we go to Abel. And then we go from Abel, we go to Enoch. We go from Enoch, we go to Noah. We go from Noah to Abraham. And then Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses. And we just move through the prophets until finally we come to the fulfillment of this vision of the prophets, Zechariah chiming in saying the same thing they said that god hath visited and redeemed his people and raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant david but i also want to point out something that uh, um, is just to me so very fascinating uh, this is really neat look at that verse 70 talking about this redemptive plan which is the story of your Bible from start to finish, from Genesis to Revelation. It's all about the unfolding of the great plan of redemption. God redeeming his people from their enemies unto himself. And concerning this great redemptive plan, he says in verse 70, as he spake by the mouth, singular, of his holy prophets, plural, which have been since the world began. You see, all the prophets in all of their prophecies cohere together and agree together so they take the sum total of everything they said and it comes out as one mouth. It's one Holy Spirit, one utterance of God given through the various prophets, but they all agree together in telling us the same story. And this answers a question that I had posited to me one time. I was asked, what about the prophets that we read about in the Old Testament where we have no record of anything that they wrote? We're not even told specifically of what they prophesied. And so does this not suggest that there are prophecies and divine revelation beyond what we have in our 66 books of the Bible that we just were not told about? Uh, this is because you see, you have people that believe that the gift of prophecy is still around and that God is still revealing truth through these prophets. So and this is particularly the case in the charismatic movement where you go in these charismatic churches and you hear them talking about having visions and dreams and hearing voices and God told me this and God told me that. And you don't have book, chapter, or verse for any of that. So you have continued revelation being made. 
or I have advanced and still advance, that the revelation of God, the prophetic word of God is completed in the 66 books of our Bible. God has revealed to us everything he wants us to know in this world. That's not to say there isn't more about God that can be known. Obviously, God is an infinite being. No book could ever exhaust the revelation of an infinite being. But God, knowing us, knowing our frame, has given us everything that we need in the way of a divine revelation in the 66 books of, their, of our Bible. We look for no additional word from God, either by dream or by vision or by voices in the heart or spoken in the room. We, we don't look for that. But then the question arises, what about those prophets that we don't read of what they prophesied? Would that not be some prophecy that's not written in the Bible? Well, it's answered right here. Even though we don't have a record of a specific thing they said, we know what they prophesied, even though we don't have a written record of it, because it's the same thing the holy prophets prophesied that we do have a written record of. They were saying the same things that were written by other prophets than themselves, so that all the holy prophets speak with one mouth the same message, and that is that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. This is also made evident in Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, and verse 20 and 21. Acts 3, 20 and 21. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of the restoration of all things. That brings us to the end of time when God's enemies are destroyed, the present heavens and earth are destroyed, and God brings in a new heaven and a new earth where he makes all things new and he restores all things back to the original condition of purity and goodness, whom the heaven must receive until the times of the restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth, singular, of all. They all said this same thing, all his holy prophets, since the world began. So when you have mention of prophets and you don't read of anything they prophesied, based on these two verses, you can say you know what they prophesied. They prophesied the same things that the prophets prophesied, whose prophecies are recorded that we can read, because it's all with the mouth of the holy prophets, singular, and they're all telling us the same thing. And you even have this exemplified in your Bible, which I think is so neat. And that is you'll have two different prophets saying the same thing. So that's giving you a clue about these prophets where we don't read anything that they wrote. They were saying the same thing as the prophets who did write. For example, you can look at the prophecy of Obadiah, and you're going to find some of the same stuff there that you find, that's a prophecy against Edom, and you're gonna find some of the same stuff there that's uttered by Jeremiah in his prophecy against Edom in Jeremiah 49. Or you can go to Micah, and you're gonna read particularly in Micah chapter four, some of the same stuff that was uttered by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter two, just to give you a couple of examples of what you can find here. And so, you find that all the prophets, the ones that we have record of their writings and the ones we don't, all are prophesying the same thing. And Zechariah is laying out to us what it was they were telling us, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. And remember something I pointed out last time. It bears repeating. I need to remind you of this is that by nature, we are all enemies, all enemies of God and enemies of anything that is of God, including his people. By nature, we are no better than our worst enemies. The only thing that makes a difference between us and them is the redeeming grace of God and the electing purpose of God. By nature, we are by nature 
the children of wrath, even as others, as Paul told us plainly in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3. And so, consider somebody that you think of as an enemy, whether it's that disagreeable neighbor, or whether it's people in your own family, or whether it's the government or particular persons in the government, you just think of people that you would consider to be enemies. And you know what you're doing? You're looking at a reflection of yourself. You're looking at the mirror image of what you are apart from the grace of God. As Paul said, are we better than they? Speaking of our enemies, he said, no, in no wise. We have by nature the same nature as they. We are exactly as they were. And he understood that plainly because he who was a preacher of the gospel had at one time been one of its most inveterate enemies. And this is why we have this piece of instruction given to us in Titus chapter 3. Titus 3, and I'll begin at verse 1 to get the full sentence. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers. Notice that, speak evil of no man. Why? Why? Why speak evil of no man? To be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness to all men. Why? For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. In other words, the reason we should speak evil of no man is we were right where they are before God saved us according to his mercy, as Titus goes on, or Paul goes on and explains in this epistle to Titus. So we had to be brought from the column of God's enemies over into the column of his friends, and then God redeems us from those who were left the column of the enemies. And this is what the reconciling work of Christ was all about, to take us who were enemies against God and the things of God and bring us over onto the side of God. This is what salvation is all about, God bringing us from enmity to friendship, reconciling us, putting us back on friendly and agreeable terms, redeeming us out of every kindred and tongue and tribe and people unto himself, redeeming us to God, bringing us to God, bringing us, instead of being in opposition and enmity against God, bringing us on the side of God. As we read in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, 1 Peter 3, 18, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, notice the purpose, that he might bring us to God, bringing us over onto God's side, so that now we're on God's side, and God's on our side, and if God be for us, who can be against us? And so having been through the reconciling work of Christ, taken out of the column of the enemies, and brought over onto the side of God, now the promise, having redeemed us from our own sins and our own enmity and state of being enemies, he now will redeem us from those we were redeemed out from among, that is, our enemies. Amazing, isn't it? Now, let's go a little further. This thing just keeps growing and growing and growing. I never cease to be amazed at the Bible I study. The more I learn, the more I find out there is to learn. The more I know, the more I can know. But the more I realize how much I don't know. It just grows and grows and deepens and deepens. It just blows my mind. All the circuits are blown here. We'll by no means finish tonight. But let's go to this next extremely important point. Let's go back to verse 7 and read it again, and follow through. Speaking of this redemption, this salvation that Jesus Christ is going to work for his people, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies 
and from the hand of all that hate us. And this is what I'm after now. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers. You see, the promise of redemption goes all the way back to the beginning of the world. And it moves through history. And now that promise is going to be performed. And that promise is going to be performed in an act of mercy toward us. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers. And to remember his holy covenant. When God sent Jesus into the world, he was remembering his holy covenant. Something he had covenanted to do. Something he had promised. And I am so thankful that God remembers his covenant. Because we don't always remember it. But God will never forget it. In fact, while I'm on this verse about God remembering his holy covenant, I'd like to just run over to Psalm 106 and look at something that, well, I pointed it out to you before, but it bears repeating at such a beautiful point. In Psalm 106 and verse um, 43, Psalm 106, 106, 43, many times did he deliver them, talking about his people, but they provoked him with their counsel and they were brought low for their iniquity. Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry, and he remembered for them his covenant and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. You and I may forget the covenant, but thank God our security does not lie in our remembering the covenant. Our security lies in God remembering it for us. Thank God. Bless God for his memory. Now, with that, that almost takes my breath away when I say that, but let's go back and pick it up to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swear to our father Abraham that he would grant us, that being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, we might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. So he's telling us here that this deliverance out of the hand of our enemies was God making good on an oath that he swore to our father Abraham. This redemptive plan that involves deliverance from our enemies can be traced back to a covenant that God made with Abraham, an oath, a promise that God made with Abraham. And we're going to investigate that promise now. So turn to Genesis 22, Genesis 22. But before I start expounding this, come up for air and get a deep breath because we're about to dive down deep into the riches of the word of God. Abraham had just finished his offering of Isaac on Mount Moriah. He had the knife lifted and was ready to take the life of his son in obedience to the commandment of God to offer him as a burnt offering. And remember the angel, when the Lord saw what he was about to do, the angel stopped him, told him to withhold his hand, and then showed a substitute in a bush, a ram caught in the thicket. And Abraham offered that ram in the stead of his son. Oh, what a beautiful picture of redemption. Christ Jesus is the ram, as it were, caught by the horns in the thicket that God offers up in the stead of ourselves so that we go free. But to all intents and purposes, Abraham is said to have offered his son. God saw the intent and took it for the deed. And Abraham was willing to do this because he had counted God able to raise him from the dead. What a tremendous demonstration of faith this was. And in response to this event, we read of this oath that God makes to Abraham that is referenced by Zacharias in this prophecy uttered under inspiration of the Holy Ghost. In Genesis 22, 15, the angel of the Lord called Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and it's not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed, remember the covenant promise 
to deliver the, the oath that God made to Abraham to deliver us from our enemies. Here's the promise. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Oh, there is so much gospel in this oath that God swears to Abraham, this promise that God makes to Abraham that he backs up with an oath. Now, the first thing, the first thing I want to do is take this passage and compare with Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 14, because Hebrews 6 is referencing this very event when God makes this oath to Abraham. And I just want to go over there and take a look at that and compare the commentary Paul makes on this in Hebrews 6 with Genesis 22. Now, look at what he says. By myself have I sworn, this is what he says in Genesis, and then this is what he swears, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed. All right, now Paul comments on this, and this is the way he words it in Hebrews 6, 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, that's what he's doing, we've just read this promise in Genesis 22, and this is the promise that Zechariah is referencing in the passage we're studying. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear no greater, he swear by himself. I mean, there is none greater than God, so if you're going to swear by the greatest, then God has to swear by himself, and that's exactly what we read he did in Genesis 22, 16, when he said, by myself have I sworn. <laughs> he swore by himself. And this is what Paul says he was saying. Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. Now in Genesis 22, 17, watch it. It says in the promise that in blessing I will bless thee. Where here he says, surely blessing I will bless thee. Well, so, so Genesis 22 says, in blessing, I will bless thee. Hebrews 6, 14, quoting it says, surely blessing, I will bless thee. Well, you see, all of that fits together because if God is in blessing, if he's in the process of blessing, in blessing, then he is surely blessing. Because you see, to be in the act of doing something is to be surely doing it. <laughs> For example, I'm preaching to you. I am in preaching to you or in teaching to you. Well, if I'm in teaching to you, I am surely teaching. See, so it all agrees neatly, even though the quotation is not exactly word for word. The Holy Spirit is speaking in both, say, both places, just letting you know that when God said with an oath, in blessing, I will bless thee, you can count on that. He is surely blessing. This you can be assured of. But when we look at this promise, this promise of blessing, oh boy, like I say, get a breath of air now because here we go. In this promise to Abraham of blessing, the ultimate blessing that is being promised is the blessing of everlasting life. The blessing that Jesus Christ came to give us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 17, 2, Jesus said, as thou hast given him, speaking of himself as the son of God, power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. The great promise that God is making to Abraham is the promise of everlasting life. Now, let me show you that is the promise. First of all, come to Psalm 133. I hope you got a good deep breath because we're going to go down a little deeper here. We've got to. I mean, God wrote this book in such a way that he cut all my work out for me. You got to work at it. You got to dig in it. You got to compare verse with verse and words with words and define terms. And when you do that, then you come up with all these treasures, but you got to dig for them. And that's why you people so generously support me so I can give myself wholly 
to digging things, these things out so I can teach you to them. And so on that point, may I say to you, a hearty and humble, thank you for your support. And I hope in having sown your carnal things, you are rewarded by reaping these spiritual things as I bring them to you. But to show you that the ultimate comprehensive blessing is the blessing of everlasting life, we read in Psalm 133.3, as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing. On the mountains of Zion, the Lord commanded the blessing. What is that blessing? He tells you, even life forevermore. Now, go back to Genesis 22, where God promises the blessing. In blessing, I will bless thee. Surely, I will bless thee. And notice where God commanded that blessing. It was on Mount Moriah. Look at Genesis 22, 2. Genesis 22, 2. Now, follow me, folks. Genesis 22, 2. He said, take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. There it was. That was the place where Abraham offered Isaac in the land of Moriah. But notice something interesting about this land of Moriah, because it was here where God built the temple, where he commanded the temple to be built. And by the way, that land of Moriah was a place that obviously was an elevated place because Abraham had to lift up his eyes to see it. And so he and Isaac go up there and he offers him there. All right, come over to 2 Chronicles chapter 3. 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and look at verse 1. Remember, Abraham offers Isaac up in the land of Moriah. And then notice in 2 Chronicles 3 and verse 1, then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah. You know where Mount Moriah would be located? In the land of Moriah. And that's where the temple was built. But later on, this place where the temple was built in the city of Jerusalem came to be known as Zion. Jerusalem was later called Zion. And when the temple was built on Mount, Zion, Mount Moriah, that word Zion extended out to include this mountain of Moriah where the temple was built because the temple was the dwelling place of God in Jerusalem and in Mount Zion. As you can see in Psalm 132:13, for the Lord hath chosen Zion and he hath desired it for his habitation. The habitation of his house was in Zion. Psalm 135, 21. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion, which dwelleth at Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. So this Mount Moriah, in the land of Moriah, where Abraham offered up Isaac, and where the temple was built, now gets subsumed over this general name for Jerusalem, the city of God, the place of the temple of God where God dwelt, as Mount Zion. So we could say that Mount Moriah is among the mountains of Zion. And it is there in the mountains of Zion that include Moriah, where God made promise to Abraham, surely blessing I will bless thee, that it was there that he commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. He commanded the blessing in Zion, which incorporates Moriah, where God said to Abraham, Surely blessing, I will bless thee. There's the commandment of blessing, and that blessing is life, eternal, everlasting life, life forevermore. Then come over to Matthew 25, Matthew chapter 25, and let's look at verse 32 where Jesus is, well, let's get verse 31, get the full picture. This takes us to the, to the second coming of Christ and the final judgment. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, 
and before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on, his, on the left. And then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. These are God's blessed and they will inherit the kingdom. But notice what he says at the end of that chapter. And I is in Matthew 26, 46. These, talk about the goats on the left hand, shall go away into everlasting punishment. But the righteous, the sheep, that'll inherit the kingdom into life eternal. The blessed go into life eternal. The blessing is life forevermore. The blessing of eternal life. But lest there be any doubt, let's just get a passage that just straight out defines the blessing for us, defines what God was promising to Abraham, and in Abraham promising to us, who are the children of Abraham, because we belong to and are chosen in Christ, the seed of Abraham, to whom these promises were made. In 1 John 2, 25, this is the promise. This is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. That's what God's talking about when he swears to Abraham, surely blessing I will bless thee. It's the blessing of eternal life. And in Genesis 17, God promises to Abraham the land of Canaan for an everlasting inheritance. And the only way that Abraham can possess that land and his seed can possess that land is an everlasting inheritance is if they are given everlasting life. This is the promise that he hath promised us, everlasting life. And with that everlasting life, an everlasting inheritance. And so when the sheep inherit the kingdom, they're inheriting an everlasting inheritance, going along with the fact that they have eternal life. Or as Paul will express it to us, in Hebrews 9, 15, talking about what Jesus did for us. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive promise of eternal inheritance. This is the promise he's promised us, eternal life and a place where we can live that eternal life even an eternal inheritance and an everlasting kingdom, eternal life and a place to live it. This is what God promises to Abraham when he says, surely blessing, I will bless this, bless thee. And notice that this promise of eternal life is sure, surely blessing. You see in this promise, the gift of eternal life for Abraham and his seed is assured, get it now, assured, in those words, surely blessing, it is assured, not offered, assured, not offered. Eternal life is not something God offers us. It is something God promises, and God remembers what he promises, and God delivers on what he promises, and that's what Zacharias is celebrating in this great prophecy, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath, which he swear to our father Abraham. I'm trying to decide now how much further to go with this, because I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time if I try to get to the next part of it. But I'll get this much. Let me get this part of what God promised to Abraham. And then God willing, next time, we'll back up and we'll look at that thing about his seed possessing the gate of their enemies. That's the promise that Zacharias is referencing when he says that we will be delivered from the hand of our enemies, saved from the hand of our enemies. That's what was promised to Abraham in those words, thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. But there's another promise here, and I think I can cover this one. Uh, in Genesis 22, as God swears to Abraham, he says in verse 18, and in thy seed 
shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Now, what's embodied in that blessing that God promises to Abraham's seed, in, that promises in the seed of Abraham that all nations in him will be blessed? What is this blessing with which all nations shall be blessed? Well, we don't have to guess. The Bible will define it for us. Come over to the book of Galatians, the book of Galatians, and let's start at chapter 2 and verse 16. Galatians 2, 16. Knowing that a man is not justified. Now, what does it mean to be justified? It means to be freed from the guilt and penalty of sin and made righteous before God. I've often quoted it this way. I know you've heard it before. And if I keep preaching and teaching, I can tell you now, you're going to hear it again because it so sums up what is involved in that expression justified. To be justified means to be just if I'd never sinned, absolved from all guilt, from all sin and all shame and made right and righteous with God. But we're not made that way by our own works, as many people think, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. And as we have taught you, that is Christ's own personal faith, whereby he rendered obedience to God, the perfect obedience to all of the commandments of God, and thus wrought for us by his faith as a man a perfect righteousness that then he makes over unto us. He gives us the righteousness that he wrought by his faith, and he gets our sin that we wrought by our unbelief. For God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we're justified not by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have been believed in Jesus, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. You see, when you believe in Jesus, that's an evidence that you have been justified by Christ's personal faith. So if you want to know that you've been justified by Christ's personal faith, then bring forth the evidence of it by believing on the Lord Jesus. As we read in Acts 13, 39, by him, that is by Jesus, by his faith, all that believe are justified, not will be, but are. So if you want to know you're justified by the faith of Christ, then show forth the evidence of that in believing. It's not your faith that's justifying you. It's his faith that's justifying you. It's your faith that's evidencing it in this particular context. Even we have believed in Jesus that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. We're not trusting our works to save us. We're trusting Jesus to do it. That's the only way we'll ever be saved is by what Jesus does. Not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So understanding that we are justified by the faith of Jesus Christ, or to put it in the words of Paul, in Philippians 3, 9, and might be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is in the law, but that which is through the righteousness of, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Romans 3, 22, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. That's what justifies us. That's what makes us right. So now that we understand that's the faith that justifies us, we're ready for Genesis, uh, pardon me, Galatians 3, 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, and that faith has already been identified as the faith of the Lord Jesus, justified with the faith of Christ, God foreseeing that the, the, the scripture, pardon me, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, and thee shall all nations be blessed. What's the promised blessing there? The blessing of justification by faith. And you can see that on down in verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, 
that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, the heathen, through Jesus Christ, the heathen justified by the faith of Christ, promised in those words, in thee and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. That's the blessing of justification by the faith of Christ, in Christ, through Christ, by Christ. And those that are justified by the faith of Christ and have the righteousness of Christ have with that righteousness the gift of everlasting life. So the justification ties right in with the promise of everlasting life as we read in Romans chapter 5 and verse 17 and following. Romans 5, 17 and following. Oh, I hope you're following this. I hope this is making sense. I'm trying so hard to make it plain. Yeah. Linda said I'm doing a good job. I have such a lovely wife. <laughs> For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, a righteousness by faith of Jesus Christ, a righteousness by one, he did it all by himself, shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. See, if we're justified by the faith of Christ, we are given with that the gift of everlasting life. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, there's the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the one, by faith of Jesus Christ. The free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. With justification comes life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, there's the obedience of Christ's faith. The obedience of one shall many be made righteous. righteous. Now in verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness, the righteousness by faith of Jesus Christ, by which we are justified and made righteous. Even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. If you have been justified with the faith of Christ, as God promised to Abraham, when he said in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed, with that blessing of justification comes the blessing of eternal and everlasting life. For this is the promise that he promised us, promised us this in our father Abraham, and backed it, oath, backed it up with an oath by himself, thus assuring that everyone that belongs to Christ, everyone that is in that promised seed of Abraham, which is identified as being our Lord Jesus Christ, in Galatians chapter 3, will be blessed with justification, righteousness, and eternal life. God is sworn to it, and that's what makes it so certain that surely those to whom he promised this shall be blessed, that blessing being life forevermore.